was the the intellectual debate l like in those days? Were you satisfied, or and now retrospectively, how do you view that intellectual debate? Yeah. Well, uh, this was a time when so-called behaviorism was uh, not was cresting. It wasn't quite at the top, but it was growing. That is what we consider now very simple quantification, but then look complicated, especially dominated by voting behavior and other attitude studies in American politics. And then the international politics, people were intrigued by the new quote-unquote scientific techniques, things of uh, a gaming, that is having people you know, play roles, and do computer simulation. I mean, of course, the computers then were very, very crude, but there was still an interest in what we call now developing formal models, but it was just beginning. And there was still, if you will, the tail end of the debate between uh, realism and what was then called idealism, which closer to what we call, at least in the United States now, uh, liberalism. But at this point, by the mid-1960s, some of these academic debates who overlap with and were overtaken by the strong political debates about Vietnam because, uh, and, and by the strong debates about what was happening on universe. But what was happening in the real world of politics very, very much spilled over into the university. In 1964, the mm. fall of 64, there was the free speech movement mm. at Berkeley and I was very active. You worked uh, with, uh, with Goffman. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, and then, as you say, I mean, you also interact with historians. Yes. You were also one of the leading members of the political psychology community. Yes. How do you combine those different yeah. elements, and how did you go from one discipline to the other? Yeah. Well, for me, it was easier to do then because yes. the space was smaller. Uh, just the amount that was written. But I got into a strange way, and again, it grows out of politics, and I, I think that m my academic work and those of my colleagues is uh, both influenced by the politics of the time, but not, I hope, a direct uh, response to my political preferences. And, but it, it's in the atmosphere, it affects you, and of course the big debate in the early 1960s was on relations with the Soviet Union. And there were two broad schools of thought, which today we call hawks and doves. And you know, the base mm -hmm. point obvious for hawks, the Soviet Union was aggressive and we needed deterrence and threats for the doves. Essentially, the Cold War is a combination of structural factors, uh, what we now call the security dilemma, and a misperception. But it was not seen quite that clearly, and partly by hearing a series of debates between Tom Schelling and Anatole Rappaport, I came to the conclusion, which I still think is right, that a lot of the debate was not over general theories, but over images of the Soviet Union and beliefs about Soviet intentions. Mm -hmm. and I think but you, why did you, how come do you have did you have such freedom to develop yeah. these research programs? Well, do, you, do you say that there's a parallel between political freedom, I mean this idea of freedom in politics, and freedom uh, in, um, in academia, and uh, less boundaries between disciplines, sort well, of an, anar an anarchic uh, movement? Well, I think Berkeley, partly it was Berkeley yes. even before arrival. Berkeley, for all its many flaws, did, um, did believe in letting the students do what they wanted to do in terms of their intellectual yes. pursuits. And uh, I think that was certainly encouraged by the political atmosphere of the free speech movement and others, but, but it predates it. It was, it was you know, a tradition of the political science department without them being very aware of it. I think that it wasn't as though they said, this is what is gonna make us distinctive. But, God, I mean, sometimes there is mutual distrust yes. between disciplines. And sociologists oh, yes. uh, do not have such a high esteem oh, no. of international relations. <laughs> no, they, they, they certainly don't. And uh, I talked to some of my friends, sociology at Columbia, and they regard us as strange uh, and also as politically reactionary because now a lot of the sociologists are more uh, on, on the left. Uh, and Goffman, 
his view was he was personally encouraging. He thought what I was doing was sort of odd, and it was stuff that he wanted. He wrote one book that dealt a little more with it, but he wanted to move it, sort of to do it and then move it, in a sense, off the table. It was not what he was interested in. So he was a little puzzled by what. Uh, could be possible today, this uh, moving from one discipline to, to the other? It's possible, but it's harder. Best illustrated in the field, well, one of the two fields I know best, which is psychology. Yes. I learned all the political psychology I know on my own, mostly by reading journals, occasionally by talking to psychologists, but not when I was in graduate school or then the, the first two years when I was finishing my dissertation, but I was at Harvard. I was with Tom Schelling at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard. At that point, I just read the journals, and there were only about three or four journals in psychology I needed to read. So I could read every relevant article in all the journals, oh, in, in a year or two, and it wasn't that complicated. I could I don't want to say master the field, that's, but I could understand the basic ideas that I needed to then apply. And you can bring uh, your own innovation yes. to the field. And, whereas you, you, I couldn't uh, do that now. Yes, why? Because it, disciplines are more special? Because it's just like the sort of big bang you know, in the universe. It's expanding so much, even within psychology, that there's such specialization that the young faculty and students in psychology, if they're in one branch, you know, they'll know that, but they really won't know much of the root and they certainly won't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it's an impediment to interdisciplinarity? I think, it, I think it really is. Uh, the barriers to entry are much higher and Diversity is a, one of my personal high value. Intellectual diversity is a very high value for me. People in the United States sometimes talk about the cutting edge of the discipline. It's a phrase that makes me cringe. It says the, you know, in the singular. There is one cutting edge. There is one way doing, and this is the advanced way. And of course, now in the U.S., this me usually means highly mathematical, either highly statistical, quantitative, or mathematical models borrowed from economics, because the people who do these think they're the wave of the future. The financial crisis has shaken them a little because it shows the foundations of economics are a bit weaker, as those of us who did political psychology have been trying to say for years. But anyway, um, so, uh, and what one of the things that worries me about American academia is that the pressures from some people to narrow, to say, here's the cutting edge. You can't do quantitative, you can't do, excuse me, qualitative work. You can't do historical work. You can't do case studies because it isn't scientific enough. I think you know, there are all sorts of ways in which the field is exciting and in a certain sense advancing. And so I think it's very important worth first in the U.S., and I'll come back internationally, to, say, encourage a great deal of diversity. We just don't know what approach. Do you think that we need a new Berkeley uh, for the future <laughs> Maybe, of academia? Well, n now that I'm a, a professor, I regard sort of student, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, uprisings a little different than I did then. But, yeah, I, I do think that, and that not sufficiently tolerant of um, intellectual diversity and not willing to take chances enough, not willing enough to take chances. It's very hard to take chances because it means you can fail. Careers can fail. You can hire someone who isn't going to work. And the strength of the American society and academic scene traditionally was uh, lots of chances to fail, but not fail completely because you could get back on, you could try again. Some of the best students we've had at Columbia from years ago had really quite poor undergraduate records. But because we had a system of taking lots of students, they could still get in graduate school if they could 
for t the loans. And now it's much, that possibility is much less. And it's, if you, so to speak, fall off the ladder, fall off the path, it's harder to get back. So it means it's harder to take risks. And that, that's very, you know, that's very unfortunate. So you should encourage risk-taking. And uh, uh, do you think that, so the best profile would be uh, uh, to have uh, foxes instead of hedgehogs? Ah, yes. And, of course, you think of the marvelous book, book by Phil Tetlock, uh, you know, on the, yeah, the work of prediction. Uh, yes, I think that, uh, but on an individual level, some individuals can be hedgehogs. That's fine, as long as there are different kinds of hedgehogs out there in the, in the field. But it's a problem. I don't, I worry, I, I, I'm not sure I encourage my students to take risks because if they take a risk and it fails, they've just lost their careers. So, you know, I feel very torn. I would like to encourage them to take risks. I put it that if they come in to me and say, I want to do this. I know it's unusual, but I'm really interested. I think it will work. I at least want to try it for a year. I will definitely encourage that. But when a student comes in with something that's an odd topic, odd approach, I have to say, you know, I think that's interesting. And I think you have to follow your own ideas. You've been taking courses for two years and then your exams and getting ready. You know, you're now intellectually ready to chart your path. But I have to tell you that I think that topic will not be attractive for the job market. And you're running some risk. But I will still support it intellectually. I mean, I will glad give you whatever help I can, even if it's a path I would have never gone down. But I can't be sure what's going to happen. The next generation will be risk adverse. Yes, it is. It, no, absolutely. It is a real problem. And my colleagues and I, and uh, my generation, and now, and somewhat younger, really worry about that. And, well, maybe one of the possible outcomes yes, is that academia would become so boring uh, that, that people either would not enter academia or just there will be a reaction yes. against that conformism. Yes, well, that's possible.